Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So recently, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, um, in the comments underneath one of my videos, someone said, um, Matt, why don't all swords and knives have full tangs? And um, I didn't really know what to say in reply to that. So let's just uh, talk about full tang for a minute. What is a full tang? Well, the majority of you, I'm sure, if you're watching this channel, know exactly what a full tang is. But just for those of you who maybe don't, or maybe are 100% clear what I mean, a full tang is where the tang is visible, usually at, at least on one of the sides, but essentially is the full width of the grip. So with this type of knife, for example, you can see that this is just an extension of the blade, so the tang is the full width of the handle and is pretty much always with the full tang. There are various ways of doing it, but usually it's riveted through. In fact, there are full tangs that can sometimes be glued or bound on all sorts, but essentially a full tang is very wide. And um, I should also mention that um, Bowie knives sometimes, or hunting knives sometimes have this. Uh, medieval knives very often had a full tang, and this is a replica of a 14th, 15th century eating knife, or more of a uh, cooking knife actually, more like a, uh, a carving knife. Um, and you can see that the tang is visible at the front and back of that. This has got, it's thinner, um, but it's still the full width of the grip, as it were. And of course most modern, I won't say most actually, but a lot of modern kitchen knives are full tang. So it's not like some super duper technology. Um, it's, it's, been something, it's been something that's been used for a lot of history. And you could say that some Bronze Age swords, um, leaf blades, are full width tangs. Um, and during, oh, and incidentally, the uh, Langsmesser, during the medieval period, the often called online just a messer, in fact, messer is just German for knife, so Lang, Langsmesser or Grossmesser is a more uh, precise term, um, uses this same method of construction, and that's to get around the German legal restrictions on sword ownership and sword carrying uh, during, the medieval, uh, during the medieval period. You, if you were of certain social class and in certain places in certain cities you couldn't carry a sword but you could carry a knife and if you make something that's really big and constructed like a knife if anyone stops you can go it's just a knife you know it's a big one but it's just constructed like a knife and in fact if we look at some kind of modern tactical swords and this is a modern tactical uh, katana um, which I will perhaps talk about in a future video, this is um, full tang, this is constructed very much like a medieval mesa in actual fact and um, that is the same kind of construction like I say as a, as a German Langsmesse and it is like a giant kitchen knife, there's nothing uh, kind of high tech about it um, but it is very strong because it's the full width of the blade and um, in 1853 in Britain uh, a chap called Charles Reeves, who owned one of the largest sword and bayonet making factories in the United Kingdom, in Birmingham, he uh, patented the full width tang, uh, the Reeves patent, known as a, uh, otherwise known as a patent solid tang. Um, and you can see that the tang is visible at the front and the back. So here, the just exactly the same as those other things I've shown, the tang is the same width, essentially, as the grip. And of course, we know that this is not how most swords in the medieval period were made. If I just grab my Albion and put it down here, too many swords as always. Um, so a traditional medieval sword, in fact most swords from history, the tang is concealed inside the grip and it is essentially a stalk. So actually what a lot of people don't realise is they think that the tang is the same piece of steel as the blade. In actual fact historically the tangs were often a separate piece of metal, usually either low carbon steel or iron and it was forge welded at high temperature onto a steel blade. This was for a couple of reasons. One um, is for cost effectiveness because um, the steel was expensive, the iron was relatively speaking cheap so if you can have an iron tang and a steel blade that's fine. You can even sometimes see the um, an area here where it transitions from the iron to the steel at the, at the base of the blade. Um, I have some 19th century swords where you can actually see that. Um, Another possible reason is because when you're mounting the sword, so the stalk goes up through the centre of the grip, through the pommel, and is pinned or riveted at the end there to keep it all tight. And if that tang is made of soft iron, then it can, when you're pinning that or riveting that end, 
it uh, compresses more easily because it's softer iron and it forges more easily because it's softer iron. Steel work hardens much more quickly when you hammer it and so it, it's harder to compress it. Another possible reason, um, and uh, metallurgists can, can debate this, um, but another possible reason is shock absorbency. If you have an iron tang, i.e. a softer tang, and iron is quite hard to, iron will bend rather than snap, whereas carbon steel will snap at some point. Um, hopefully it will bend before it snaps, but it will snap. If you have a, an iron tang, then potentially you're making the tang more shock absorbent. It might bend, but it, it won't break. Um, and clearly you don't want, <laughs> that's one place you definitely want your blade breaking is, is in the middle of the handle because the blade will fly out and the sword will fall apart. But most swords were made like this rather than full width tang. So despite the fact in the same period that this sword or the original type of this sword would have been used and this kitchen knife would have been used, they were using full tangs on these and on Langsmessers, but they were using stalk tangs on most swords. So coming back to the original question, why did they do that type of tang on most swords instead of doing full width tangs? We know that they knew how to do full width tangs because they were doing it. Um, they were doing it on knives, they were doing it on swords. So why didn't they make all swords with a full width, um, as it was known in the 19th century Britain anyway, as a patent tang? So like this sword. We know that the British cavalry at least went from a stork tang, like on the medieval sword, to a full width tang because they regarded it as stronger. So why didn't everyone use full width tangs? We know, for example, if we look behind me, I've got obviously an array of swords behind me. Um, some of these officers' swords, the officers paid extra money, just grab one, at, we've got one there, we've got one there, um, one at the bottom as well, but if just grab one at random. Um, this has a patent tang, full width tang there, but this is not normal, that is a special order. So the officer who bought this sword um, paid more money to get the full width tang fitted um, as an optional extra, like buying an extra on your car for example. So they paid more money, and, and quite a bit more money as well, to get that full width tang, which was reputed for its strength, pretty much indestructibility. Um, and the question is, why didn't they just build that as standard on all swords? I think part of the answer is economy, um, but it can't be the total answer because kitchen knives are made like that. It's not like kitchen knives are expensive objects. So I don't have a good answer for you. Why were most swords throughout history made with a stalk going through the hilt and only some swords and knives were made with full width tanks? I don't know. Um, it's something to debate about. I've kind of been around all of the possibilities I can think of. Economy, I don't think that's it, because I don't think it costs more to make a sword with a full width tang. Is it a question of weight? Um, again, I don't think so. Yes, you could say that a stalk tang, you can make a lighter weapon, because a full width tang has more metal in it. But then they didn't worry about that for lungs messers. They didn't worry about that for these officers' swords or the 1853 cavalry sword. And those swords weigh the same as, as the ones without patent hilts or without full width tanks. So I don't really know the answer, guys. Um, you could make most types of medieval sword with a full width tang. I mean, you could say, oh, well, you can't make a sword like, a, like an arming sword or a long sword with a full width tang. But they did. They made, you can find, you can find uh, Kriegsmesser, as they're sometimes called, I think only in modern uh, lingo, um, but you can find two-handed, longsword-sized Langsmesser with full width tangs on them. So why didn't they make longswords like that? Um, why didn't they make arming swords like that? I honestly don't, I just don't really know. Um, so there we go, it's some, something to debate about. I don't think it's economy, I don't think it's weight. I don't think it's handling because you can you can shift about the way that the sword is made. Why weren't you know Japanese swords are famous for having quite thick, quite wide tangs? Why didn't they ever move to a construction that was far more sturdy than their um, just manugi pin pegged hilt? I don't know. Something to debate about. But there we go. It's not very often I do a video where I basically talk a lot and then at the end of it say I don't know. Um, but it's an interesting enough topic, and I'd be interested to see your opinions on it. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.